The people in charge of a nuclear plant in western Japan have taken another step toward restarting a reactor. Nuclear regulators say the reactor in Ehime Prefecture meets government requirements adopted after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Officials with the Nuclear Regulation Authority gave their unanimous approval. Their backing removes one of the remaining hurdles to restarting the number three reactor at Shikoku Electric Power Company's Ikata plant. Critics have found fault with the operator's safety measures. They say assumptions about the magnitude of potential earthquakes are too low. And they say measures to prevent a hydrogen explosion are insufficient. But regulators say they've confirmed that the utility has taken sufficient steps to address such concerns. The reactor would be the fifth in Japan to get the green light to resume operations. Two reactors at a plant in Kagoshima Prefecture and two in Fukui Prefecture have also been approved. Well, members of a civic group who are against the restart expressed their concerns. Even though the NRA has approved safety measures for the reactor, there's no guarantee there won't be a serious accident or a large-scale emission of radioactive materials. We can't say it's safe. Shikoku Electric must still win approval for equipment at the reactor and pass inspections. And local government officials must also give CS their consent. 134 137 detected from all of the marine soil samples along eastern Japan coastal area. July 13, 2015. From the report of NRA, Nuclear Regulation Authority. Cesium-134-137 was detected from 32 of 32 marine soil samples taken this May. The sampling locations are offshore of Miyagi, Fukushima, Ibaraki and Chiba Prefecture. The report was published on July 13, 2015. The report says the samples were taken from 30 meters depth to 660 meters and collected by Marine Ecology Research Institute, MARI, and analyzed by Japan Atomic Energy Agency, GIA. CS-134 was not detected from only one sample. CS-134 was measured from all the rest of the samples. The highest reading was 164 bq slash kilograms in total of CS 134 137. The sampling location was Aprox. In 40 kilometers southeast of Fukushima nuclear plant. Other nuclets such as Senior 90 and U-235 were not even tested. They did not collect samples from Tokyo Bay either. from Tokyo have laid out the welcome mat in London. They've staged a business seminar to encourage foreign companies to set up shop in the Japanese capital. The Metropolitan Government began holding such events last year. Governor Yoichi Masuzoe said in a video message that Tokyo intends to make full use of the business opportunities that come with hosting the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. He said he wants to learn from London, which hosted the 2012 Games. A city official gave an introduction to how Tokyo will simplify procedures for foreign companies to launch Japanese operations. She said the city will partially subsidize local recruitment costs. I think it was a very useful introduction to the opportunities uh, in Tokyo. Tokyo officials say more than 40 companies, mainly from the U.S. and Europe, have established business bases in the city in the past the two years. The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has decided to resume dismantling the cover of the number one reactor building. Officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, say the work will begin later this month. The dismantling is part of efforts to decommission the facility, which suffered a meltdown after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The number one reactor building was damaged by a hydrogen explosion. TEPCO workers installed the cover to prevent radioactive material from dispersing. The officials initially planned to start dismantling the cover last year to clear away radioactive rubble and remove spent nuclear fuel stored in a pool inside the building. The plan was postponed several times because of concerns about the dispersal of radioactive substances. Engineers also found a problem with a device that controls the airflow in the building when dismantling work was set to begin in May. The engineers say they've addressed the problem. 
TEPCO officials decided to resume the dismantling work on July 28th as long as weather conditions permit. As part of the plan, chemical agents will be sprayed to prevent radioactive dust from being released into the air. Engineers plan to remove the six roof panels in about four months. Cesium 134 137 measured over 200% of safety level from Fukushima rice. July 15, 2015. According to Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, excessive amount of CS 134-137 was detected from two unpolished rice samples produced in Fukushima City. The rice was experimentally produced but not distributed, the farmer states. The highest reading was 220 BQ slash kilograms in total of CS 134-137. The safety limit is supposed to be 100 BQ slash kilograms. The sample was brought to Fukushima Agricultural Technology Center this July. Shinzo Abe wants to make it easier for food products from his country to be imported into Taiwan, and he's asked ruling party lawmakers to get involved. Taiwanese officials tightened controls last Friday due to fears of radiation from the 2011 nuclear accident in Fukushima Prefecture. The new regulations include mandatory certificates of origin for food products from anywhere in Japan. Abe has spoken with former State Minister for Foreign Affairs Nobuo Kishi and other lawmakers who belong to a group that promotes relations with Taiwan. Kishi reported to the Prime Minister that during a recent visit to Taiwan, they asked President Ma Injo to lift the tighter restrictions as soon as possible. Abe said the authorities and general population of Taiwan should be made aware of the safety of Japanese food. He urged Kishi utilize the group's close connections with Taiwan to address the issue. Well, consumption of some traditional Japanese food has fallen dramatically for years, so manufacturers are looking to market its healthy qualities abroad. NHK World's Sakura Koyama reports. This farm is in Gunma Prefecture, north of Tokyo. Gunma is Japan's top producer of these yams. The yams are ground up to become konyaku. It's low in calories and rich in fiber. But domestic consumption has fallen by more than 60% since the 1970s. So Gunma's authorities are working with local manufacturers to boost exports to the U.S. The prefectural government opened a specialist cafe in New York City last year. The cafe offers cognac dishes in a culinary experiment to find out what Americans like. But many people are put off by the spongy elastic texture of the food. Still, cognac noodles are a hit. The restaurant manager, Sachiko Mitsuno, is back in Japan. She is reporting her findings to the maker of the noodles. When mixed with starch, the noodles are less chewy and go down smoothly. New Yorkers seem to like their appearance and texture. But no, the noodles are too long. The customers have difficulty eating them. Unlike many Asians, Americans don't suck noodles, so the 60 centimeter noodles are a bit of a struggle. It's a rare chance to get information from on the ground, so I was really interested in today's briefing. This will help us make further progress. Here's another company that's innovating in Saitama. It has developed a healthy salad dressing. The dressing looks and tastes like mayonnaise, but it contains no eggs. Instead, it uses dietary fiber from konyaku yams. That means the dressing is cholesterol-free. The fiber has another health benefit. It helps discharge extra cholesterol from the body.
Last month, the dressing's flavor was also recognized when it won the Superior Taste Award at the prestigious food competition in Belgium. The award has triggered a rise in foreign orders. The company shipped the dressing to Australia, Singapore, and two other markets, and is now getting orders from Europe, too. Business negotiations with France are now underway. Our firm is very small, but we are eager to promote Konyaku worldwide. Konyaku has a long tradition in Japan, but creating demand abroad is forcing changes in appearance and texture. Sakura Koyama, NHK World. Uh, fishermen in Vietnam make a big contribution to the national diet and an even bigger one to their economy. But now they're aiming to hook another market. They're trying to boost shipments of sushi-grade tuna to Japan. But they're finding it isn't as easy as it looks. NHK World's Kyoko Fujita reports. Many diners at Japan's sushi restaurants price tuna above everything else on the menu. <laughs> Managers at this fishery company in central Vietnam have got their sights set on Japan's lucrative sushi market. They're checking the quality of tuna haul that just came in. The company is taking part in a new government initiative to export sushi-grade tuna to Japan. They know if they can meet the exacting standards of Japanese chefs, they can make a lot more money. Prices in Japan are four or five times higher than in Vietnam. Vietnamese exporters sell 60% of their tuna to the U.S. and Europe much of it for use in cheap canned products. To sell more fish to Japan, they need to change the way they work, but many don't know how or can't afford the equipment they need. We want to increase the number of fish we catch at a higher quality so that we can sell them at higher prices. Local government officials turn to a Japanese company for help. Hirosuke Kado runs an import business. He agreed to lend a hand in the hope of getting something from the project himself. But when Kado imported Vietnamese tuna in a trial last year, he found some of the meat was burnt and couldn't be used for sushi. Engineers at his firm have been showing the Vietnamese how to catch tuna the Japanese way. If the tuna thrashes about, its body temperature soars by about 30 degrees. The engineer says it's essential to catch the tuna gently to ensure the flesh doesn't overheat and get damaged. Teaching fishermen the skills they need and changing the way they think, that's the hardest part. Kado realized it would take time to train the Vietnamese, so he decided to speed things up. He met with a Japanese firm that makes fishing equipment. Together, they designed a device that makes it easier to catch tuna the right way. The device features a wire that beams an electric current into the lure to stun the fish and knock it out fast. They say that keeps the temperature down and preserves the flesh. Importantly, they made the device smaller and cheaper than those in Japan. By using this, fishermen can bring in very high quality tuna. That way, they can make more money, which will help their industry. I'm going to do my best to make this project a success. Local officials liked Kado's idea and decided to teach fishermen how to use the device with the help of Japanese engineers. 
Tuna used for sashimi has to be of very high quality. If we can meet the Japanese standard, we can expand our exports to any country. Fishermen in Vietnam are realizing there are big opportunities in Japan as long as they can change the way they work. A business tie with Japan is paving the way.